Welcome to the first lecture in the series on evolution and strategy, lecture one, life history and reproduction. The lives of animals follow a standard pattern. They are born, they feed and grow, they try to survive, reproduce and have offspring before they die. It's a ubiquitous story. Those organisms that successfully survive and reproduce pass on their genes that enable their offspring in turn to do the same. In this series of lectures, we will consider how natural selection has shaped and optimized the development, behavior, and life stories of animal species. We will see how this process can lead to many surprising, often counterintuitive results. So, life history and reproduction. We'll be answering a number of questions, considering a number of questions in this lecture. What is reproductive value? What is the optimal number of offspring for a parent to have? Why does getting old cause health problems? And why does, how, why does optimal strategy normally involve compromise? That is a theme that will come up again and again in this lecture series. Before we dive in to uh, the rest of the content for this lecture, I want us to remember uh, what fitness and natural selection are. Fitness is the ability to survive and reproduce and have offspring that do the same. This is um, where we get survival of the fittest from this idea. Those individuals that can survive, reproduce and have offspring that do the same are considered the fittest. They have a higher fitness level. Natural selection acts to maximize total reproduction over the course of an entire life. That is something that we need to consider when we think of overall fitness of an organism. So, firstly, reproductive value. There are trade-offs between survival and reproduction. If we think about an organism's fitness, an organism that produces a higher number of offspring per year is going to have a higher relative fitness. Fitness is often given uh, the letter W. Also, an individual who is able to produce offspring for many years will have a higher fitness. So we see the same trend whether we're looking at number of offspring per year or number of years that an individual can produce offspring. But if we consider these two variables, relationship between, uh, between these two variables, then we don't get the same pattern. Think about how the number of years an individual can produce offspring would impact the number of offspring that they can produce per year. A reasonable hypothesis would be that there is a negative relationship between these two. Having a large number of offspring every year is going to be extremely energetically taxing, okay, and is so likely to reduce the number of years of, that an individual can produce offspring. So Snell and King in 1977 did an experiment involving rotifers looking at this phenomena and looking for evidence for it. Um, rotifers are microscopic aquatic animals um, and Snell and King were using asexually producing reproducing clones. They uh, were studying these rotifers and every 12 hours they collected survival and reproduction data uh, about them. Here we have uh, some of their results. Fecundity at a certain age is the number of offspring that an individual is giving, uh, is producing. And this is the individual's probability to survive. What we can see is that any individual who is producing a large number of offspring, they are relatively unlikely to survive the next 12 hour sequence. Those of individuals producing fewer offspring are more likely to survive the next 12 hours. So having lots of offspring in any given moment is, seems to be detrimental to future survival for an individual. We can think of this in terms of reproductive value. Here we've got a slightly different axis. This is the reproductive value of the individuals. Reproductive value, and this is critical, is the expected number of offspring in the future at a certain age. Individuals that have a 
low fecundity at a certain age, that means they're having few offspring, was shown to have a higher reproductive value. In other words, if they were not producing many offspring at a given time, they were likely to produce many more offspring in the future. Similarly, those who uh, produced a, a lot of offspring at a given moment had a lower reproductive value. In other words, we could expect them to produce fewer offspring uh, in the future. If they have more offspring now, they will have fewer in the future. Fitness is more closely tied to overall reproductive value than it is to current fecundity. Okay. Whether an organism is fit or not depends on how many offspring they can have in the future rather than how many offspring they can have at that particular moment. And this is really critical. Understanding this is really critical to understanding uh, what is to come. We can plot the human reproductive value and, and, and maybe it would follow a curve something like this. Our reproductive value uh, starts off fairly high. We have the potential to have lots of, we have the potential to have offspring in the future. And over the course of our childhood, that actually increases because of course, some children do not survive um, to being a reproductive age. Um, so the fact that we survive our childhood as we survive it increases the chance that we're going to produce more offspring later on. Then after puberty, our reproductive value gradually falls as the chance of us having offspring in the future gradually slowly falls away until eventually when we are unable to have kids at all, uh, then our reproductive value reaches zero, which is the number of, remember, reproductive value is the number of offspring that an individual will have in the future. One thing to think about, uh, which I think is a particularly interesting thought, is uh, what would the difference in the uh, reproductive value curve be for males and females? It's not going to be exactly the same. How would this curve be slightly different? One other thing to consider is if reproductive value is so closely tied to fitness, a gene that affects reproductive value at an older age, let's say up here on the graph, will have a much smaller impact in terms of natural selection than a gene that impacts an individual earlier on in their life, say before they reach puberty. Natural selection does not always act equally based on the timing at which a gene kicks in at different points in an individual's life. When genes are selected for or against makes a difference. If a gene is being heavily selected against here, it will quickly be removed from the gene pool. If a gene is being selected against here, it's unlikely uh, to actually experience much selection, even if it's detrimental, because the um, individuals have a lower reproductive value at that time. They're not going to pass on, uh, they're not, that trait is not going to affect their future survival um, ability. Uh, their future reproductive value. So we can think of this overall as being having, you can have different strategies. We cannot produce lots and lots of offspring over a long lifespan. It's too energetically taxing. So we can either produce more offspring in a shorter amount of time, dying sooner, or producing fewer offspring and living longer. So which strategy here is better, the red line, this steep one, or the blue line? Well, we can calculate the area under these two curves, and for these two curves, the area is exactly the same. Therefore, the number of offspring that they produce over their lifetime is the same. These are equally successful strategies. Which one would be appropriate given a niche of an organism a niche of, an, of a species, well, that is going to um, be different depending on the niche. Many characteristics involve trade-offs. Many traits, as they change from one extreme to another, can affect both the reproduction of an individual and the survival of an individual. And sometimes these two things can run counter to each other. Say, for example, the width of a woman's hips. Wider hips will enable a woman to uh, reproduce more easily, okay, and have more offspring. But 
potentially if her hips are too wide, that's going to impede her survival. So when we combine these two, we get this uh, distribution curve like this with a maximum fitness, an optimal fitness somewhere in the middle. This is a form of stabilizing selection. We're often used, used to thinking about stabilizing selection in terms of some survival characteristic, some survival selection pressure that is impacting both the lower phenotypic and higher phenotypic extreme. But in this case, it's actually reproduction impacting it one way and survival impacting it the other, resulting in an optimal um, trait uh, uh, intensity. Next up, I want to think about clutch size strategy with you. Clutch size is the number of offspring an individual can produce uh, should produce in any given uh, moment, in any given year, let's say. So most clutch size uh, thought experiments and a lot of research has been done on um, egg laying in birds. How many eggs should a bird lay in a given at a given time? Obviously, there's advantages to laying more eggs. More eggs means more offspring in the next generation, passing on more of the genes. But there's costs too. Perhaps an, a bird should lay fewer eggs. The act of producing the eggs is very energy intensive and so can affect the parent's survival. And the care for each of those individual offspring is also extremely energy intensive. The more eggs there are, perhaps the lower the likelihood of survival of each of those individuals. And so what is the optimum number um, that a bird should lay? Here we have a hypothetical survival curve where one is guaranteed survival. Even if a bird lays just one egg, that offspring is not guaranteed to survive, but they have a really good chance of survival, surviving. Let's say it's 0 0.9 okay, probability that the individual survives. And having a second, maybe that doesn't affect, the, the parent is very easily able to cope with two individuals and so having a second, actually, they both are just as likely to survive as one another. Having a third, well, then that reduces the survival of the offspring slightly. Having a fourth, fifth, sixth, etc., gradually, gradually reduces the chance of survival of the offspring. The question then is, what is the optimum strategy? Should the bird just lay two eggs? Okay both of which have got a really high chance of surviving? Or should they produce many eggs, let's say 10 eggs, all of which have a very low chance of surviving? Well, what we need to think about is actually the area underneath these points. Whatever maximizes the area underneath here is going to give us the optimal strategy. Fitness is equal to the number of eggs times the probability of each one. And when we plot that out and we look at the fitness for uh, different numbers of eggs, we see that actually the optimal strategy here is to lay six eggs. That would give us the largest area, okay, number of eggs times survival probability of each, that will give us the highest fitness value. Okay, so this is, we would expect then, this, in this population of birds, the eggs, the birds delay six eggs. That would be, that would be expected. That would be the optimal strategy for this. Now, when this is, uh, when uh, Roth uh, in 1992 did an experiment on great tits, Paris Major, um, they found a set of surprising results. They were counting the number of uh, eggs in nests, and you can see here, this is the number of eggs, and you can see that um, the average number of eggs was around eight or nine eggs per nest, okay, in, in lots and lots of um, nests. You can see it's a really big study here. Um, and then they counted how many of the young uh, survived. And you can see that when there were more, we actually got, more young surviving. This is really surprising. When the clutch size was larger, more offspring survived. In fact, they tried adding eggs to the nests and the adults seemed to be able to handle it fine. They seemed to be able to 
cope with having more offspring, and those offspring successfully survived and, and were fine. So this is really strange. Why is it that these birds are not then producing more offspring? Why not produce 11 or 12 offspring, which we would expect would have a higher fitness because they are um, surviving quite well. Those, those nests that have got 11 or 12, they've actually got the highest number of offspring surviving. That seems to be by far the best strategy, but instead it's a lower value that the birds are producing. Why hasn't natural selection caused this peak to be further to the right? We should see this many eggs. That's what we would expect. But we often see fewer eggs being produced. We need to think about survival of the adults to the next reproductive cycle. There is a cost to producing offspring, a reproductive cost. And while it may be optimal in a given moment to produce lots more eggs than they are, that cost of doing that is quite high. By reducing the cost for the adult, they are ensuring, they are increasing the likelihood of their future survival. Recall that survival and future reproduction declined with reproduction. So in other words, these parents are effectively saving themselves, okay, by not getting going, putting themselves through kind of some kind of burnout as they try to keep all of these offspring alive. There is, they are increasing their fitness by enabling themselves to survive longer by lowering their cost of having offspring. So what about the next generation? It's quite interesting, when they manipulated the mother's clutch, when they gave her more eggs, they found that the daughter's clutch size decreased. In other words, you give more eggs to the mother, when the daughter then goes on to reproduce herself, she has fewer eggs. And conversely, if you took eggs away from the mother, the daughter's clutch size increased. So this is kind of returning back to the, nor to the norm. Okay, like increasing it back up. Why is that? Well, perhaps the parents are able to provide a little more nutrition to these offspring when they have fewer siblings or less nutrition to those that have slightly more siblings. Or perhaps it's to do with the fact that the daughters are competing more in the next generation when there's more of them in the initial clutch and vice versa when there's fewer. It's interesting that there seems to be some kind of almost self-correction that happens when we manipulate the clutch size. Why can't organisms just keep reproducing forever? Why not? Why don't they go on and on and on reproducing um, for the rest of for their lives? I think it's an important thing for us to think about the difference between aging and this term senescence. If you have a diamond and you put it away somewhere safely and you come back to it in 20 years or 50 years, the diamond will be essentially the same. It will have aged, it will be older, but it won't have changed in any meaningful way. Senescence is slightly different from aging, but we often equate it with aging. Senescence is a gradual degradation in the quality of living. In other words, the ability to uh, reproduce um, fades with age. And we see this degradation of the quality of living if we think about lots of different things. A 90-year-old typically cannot run as fast as an 80-year-old who can't typically run as fast as a 70-year-old, etc., going down through um, the ages. So why, why is it that we go through senescence? Why do we experience senescence? What is it that causes that change? May interest you that there's not actually any fundamental physical reason, uh, no law of physics or something like that, that means that an organism has to go through senescence. There are some species, such as lobsters, that don't uh, go through senescence. 
However, we don't, you know, it might make you think, well, what, why don't we have lobsters then that are uh, thousands of years old? Well, there's lots of different things that can kill lobsters, right? Predators and disease can kill lobsters, okay? Um, fishermen catching them, etc. And so lobsters don't live forever, um, but they don't go through this kind of degradation of the quality of, of, their, of their living. So, so why, why do we have this then? Why do we go through this senescence process? Why do we um, get elderly um, and, and less physically capable? Why do we lose our health? There are two hypotheses um, to, to why that is. One is the rate of living hypothesis, and the other is the evolutionary hypothesis. And we'll consider each of these in turn. The rate of living hypothesis, uh, the idea is that as time goes by, our cells divide and metabolism happens. And as metabolism happens, that living process, with releasing free radicals, etc., causes gradual harm to our bodies. And so our metabolic our metabolism and our cell division, etc., ultimately leads to our demise. This is sometimes uh, coined the named the, the live fast, die young hypothesis. OK, as we think about these individuals, right, who who didn't live a very, very long time, um, didn't maybe live as long as those who uh, experimented less with chemistry or had less uh, dramatic lives. The idea is that um, if, as we go through metabolism, cumulative damage over time causes us to become elderly, causes us um, to cause senescence. If this is true then there's a couple of logical um, consequences. Metabolic rate, how fast these reactions are happening in our bodies, should correlate with a rate, the rate of senescence. Faster metabolic rate should equal um, getting elderly faster. Natural selection should also minimize senescence as much as possible so that we can produce offspring for as many years as is possible. So those are our two statements. Let's look at those two in turn. Orstad and Fisher uh, did a really interesting study uh, involving uh, looking at the metabolic uh, rate of different mammalian orders. So this is metabolic rate up the side. I'm sorry, it's slightly cropped down here. Um, we would expect energy expenditure per gram to be about the same for all species. Um, and so they we're looking at this. Um, but what we see is actually there is a huge amount of variation between each order of mammals, a huge amount of uh, energy expenditure. So it's not greatly surprising that bats here um, have a very high metabolic rate. OK, not surprising because they need to fly. The group that I want to particularly draw your attention to, though, is this group here. These are the marsupials. Marsupials have a lower metabolic rate than placental mammals, but they also have shorter lifespans. So this runs counter to the rate of living hypothesis. Marsupials have got a lower metabolic rate, but they have shorter lifespans. Let's look at the second point. The idea that natural selection should have reduced senescence as much as possible. Luckenbill et al. in uh, 1984, um, what these guys did was they had um, fruit flies and they allowed uh, their control group of fruit flies to um, breed uh, whenever they wanted. This is called the early reproducing group. Okay, and when they reproduce when they wanted, we see that their longevity, how long the fruit flies lived, stayed about the same. What Luckenbill and his team did uh, was they then also had their experimental group, which they only allowed older, in which they only allowed the older females to breed. So only if a female uh, survived for a long time was she then allowed to breed. That obviously created artificial selection for uh, aging uh, for the ability for females to live for a long time. And what they saw was this quite dramatic increase, almost doubling of the lifespan of the fruit flies in a very short amount of time, in just 15 generations, 
their lifespan dramatically increased. So there's little evidence for the rate of living hypothesis. Senescence is not correlated with metabolic rate. And if it's selected for, senescence can be delayed. Aging can be delayed. So it hasn't been optimized. We need another way to explain why senescence happens. This brings us to the evolutionary hypothesis and something called antagonistic pleiotropy. We're going to run through a thought experiment. Thought experiments are quite useful um, when we're thinking about evolution because, of course, we can, um, we can quickly carry out um, something that's complicated uh, in our minds um, to work out what the logical conclusions are. This thought experiment is based on a thought experiment um, by Medawar. I want you to imagine that you're a scientific lab technician. You're working in a school, and unfortunately in this school, quite often pupils break the uh, volumetric uh, conical flasks uh, by dropping them on the floor in, in their lessons. And so you have to replace these flasks on a pretty regular basis. You're getting frustrated by this, but then one day, a, all of a sudden, a magical uh, wizard shows up. And this wizard says to you, hey, I can give you this new type of conical flask that will replace yours. Now, this type of conical flask is just like the ones you had before, in that if nobody touches it and it just stays there in the cupboard, it will live forever in terms of it will never break. But it can still break like the other ones, you know, if a pupil drops it. And you're saying, well, how is this different from any other conical flask then? Well, this one, it can reproduce. Slowly, every now and again, they can still break. But if there is space in the cabinet where you keep these, those that are not broken will slowly multiply and fill the available space. This is a great deal. It's a great deal. You you're absolutely going to take this deal, right? You've got these conical flasks that will slowly replace themselves if a pupil drops one. Sounds good. Now, maybe you 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 work with this for a while, and uh, and and you're very you're very happy. You're very satisfied with this. But what you find is that uh, the conical flasks, you know, sometimes you do still have to buy in some new conical flasks because pupils will break them maybe slightly faster than uh, than they reproduce on their own. You kind of wish, man, I wish I had flasks that reproduced just a little bit faster so that uh, I could keep up with these pupils, these careless pupils who keep dropping them. Well, wonderfully, the wizard shows up again and he says to you, well, I can give you now new flasks that will multiply twice as fast as before. But there's a catch. If a flask ever makes it to 50 years old, it will crack and break on its own. Shall I make the change? Would you take that change? Sounds like a pretty good deal. I'm not sure in your school whether the flasks would ever make it normally to 50 years old but you get this amazing ability for them to reproduce. This is a great deal. You absolutely should take it, okay? You don't have to worry about replacing these flasks because they're going to reproduce much faster. However, you have taken on a compromise. If just by the merest, you know, fluke, some flask survives 50 years, it's gonna break but that doesn't seem like a particularly big loss. The conditions you've been given uh, are something called antagonistic pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is when a gene has two different effects, two different impacts. Antagonistic pleiotropy is when those two different impacts run counter to one another. If a gene is beneficial at a young age, but harmful at an old age, after reproduction, it will be selected for. Think about that curve that we looked at earlier. Senescence is therefore inevitable because of evolution. Genes that benefit us when we're young, but are harmful at an old age, will have been selected for in our past. 
So is there any evidence for this? Yes, there absolutely is. Uh, one example that you've probably heard of is Huntington's disease, Huntington's genetic disorder. You may be familiar with the fact that Huntington's genetic disorder has severe physical and mental effects kicking in around the age of 40 years old or older, or, or slightly earlier, but definitely after an individual has been through their reproductive prime. Huntington's causes destruction of neurons in the brain, okay, causing uh, severe symptoms uh, around motor control, cognition, and ultimately death. It's a really horrible um, disease, genetic disease. So why would it be selected for in our population? It turns out that people who have Huntington's disease have a reduced cancer risk at younger ages. Not only that, people with Huntington's, that individuals who have Huntington's are 1.24 times likely to have offspring than their unaffected siblings. Okay, they have more offspring than their unaffected siblings. So that means that natural selection will increase the amount of Huntington's within a population. It is actually selected for by natural selection. And when we think about the fact that until recently, people were often not living past the age of 40, it's only natural that it would be um, selected for within um, our wider population. So why do we go through senescence? Our evolutionary history included the fixation of many antagonistically pleiotropic genes. In other words, within our evolutionary history, way back in our ancestors, there were many genes that impact us negatively when we're old, but are beneficial when we are young. And so they are selected for. There will be the implication of this is there's, there's going to be no easy cure for senescence, for the aging process, because the causes are actually very numerous and would potentially trade off against other aspects of our health when we are younger. So let's conclude um, some of the key points from this lecture. Life history involves complicated trade-offs to maximize an individual's fitness. Remember, fitness is the ability to survive, reproduce, and have offspring that do the same. But often it's not entirely obvious where that trade-off would fall until we consider the whole span of an organism's life. Overall reproductive potential is selected for over any immediate benefits. How many offspring you can produce in the future is actually more important than how many you're producing at any given moment. Another thing to, uh, that we, were, we can conclude is that the relative impact of genes varies over a lifetime. And how that those genes impact an individual's life and when, almost more critically, almost as critically when they impact an individual's life um, is going to lead to um, significant differences in natural selection. Maximizing fitness can ultimately resort in shorter lifespans. In the next lecture, we will be considering how organisms act within their family groups. How is it that natural selection can cause tension, cause conflict between parents and their offspring, and how can it cause cooperation between them? And why does it sometimes produce one outcome and sometimes the other? Until then, goodbye.